you would stand up on your feet. We're going to start worship just a little differently today, but it's going to be a, a great morning of worship to the Lord. And so as we begin, I'm going to read Psalm 100, and then we're going to sing together, all right? Psalm 100 says, Shout for joy to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before Him with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is He who made us, and we are His. We are His people, the sheep of His pasture. So enter His gates with thanksgiving and His courts with praise. Give thanks to Him and praise His name, for the Lord is good, and His love endures forever. forever. His faithfulness continues through all generations. God, today we praise you because your faithfulness endures for, through all generations. Your name is great. Jesus, you are our King and our Savior, and today we look to you and worship you this morning. It's in your name I pray, and we sing together now. Amen. created this universe and the God who created us and the God who wants a relationship with us. So this morning, Lord, we give you praise and we give you glory. God, I pray in this moment that we would just center our eyes on you, that we would fix our eyes on the Jesus that died and that rose from the grave. Lord, that we would remember all that you have done, Lord, for all of eternity, but then also all that you've done in our own lives. Lord, you are worthy to be praised. And so this morning as a church, we just get to praise you out of the overflow of our hearts, Lord, that we would remember with joy all that you are and all that you've done. And so, Lord, as we sing this new song this morning, Lord, would you help us just to celebrate the fact that you are the God who will call us home one day. God, you are the God who gives us freedom today and forever. Lord, you're the God who breaks chains of sin and chains of shame. And Lord, you are the God of victory. And so this morning as we sing, I just pray that we would fix our eyes on Jesus, who is the author and the finisher of our faith. We give you praise and we give you glory this morning. In Jesus' name, amen. Lord, I confess. Shackles 
to look forward to on Easter this we celebrate Easter <laughs> not as a surprise but because we know you're alive Jesus so today help us to trust in you completely in every moment knowing the truth that you are indeed risen from the grave amen for my way Sing, I depend. I depend on you. I depend on you for the sun to rise, for my sleep at night. I depend on you. Draw me close and see 
think we have a way. We may think we could come up with a plan, but you have the plan, Jesus. 
So help us to lean into you. Help us to take not just one step of faith, God, but help us to follow you every single day in whatever you're calling us to. Whether it's to just to start meeting with you every day, whether it's to share the gospel with a coworker, whether it's to finally get down on our knees and admit that we need you, Jesus. I pray that we would follow you in obedience and depend on you every single day. Thank you, Lord, for this time that we can sing and celebrate you together and continue worshiping as we open your word in just a moment. God, we love you. We thank you for Jesus, and it's in his name I pray this morning. Amen. For almost 100 years, in big cities with 100 skyscrapers and tiny towns with one stoplight, on college campuses and Native American reservations, and churches too many to count, hundreds of thousands of men and women and boys and girls have made hundreds of thousands of life-changing decisions. Almost none of them knew her name, and yet she was there. Annie Armstrong lived more than a hundred years ago. Only this one picture of her survives. History could have easily forgotten her, but Annie Armstrong is worth remembering. In the late 1800s, when most women had no voice, Annie was one of the first to speak up. First, for the urban poor in her hometown of Baltimore, and then for Southern Baptist missionaries around the world who desperately needed support. It was for these people that she helped start the National Women's Missionary Union. As its first executive leader, she gave women a platform in their local church and in ways that they'd never done before. These women helped focus Southern Baptist attention on the hurting and the lost and the missionaries trying to reach them. Annie wrote letters, 18,000 in just one year. And she traveled across America, encouraging missionaries and inspiring churches to pray, to give, and to act. She worked long hours, paid her own expenses, and refused to accept a salary. And in the darkest days of the Depression, right before she died, an offering was named after her. Today, the Annie Armstrong Easter Offering helps missionaries in the U.S. and Canada start new churches and meet needs through Compassion Ministries. Over the years, Southern Baptists have given more than $1 billion to that offering, and 100% of it, every penny, has gone straight to the mission field. There's still work left to do. A need is bigger than ever, and that's why even though she lived more than a century ago, and even though only one picture of her survives, Annie Armstrong's influence lives on. Because today in North America, just as it's been from the beginning, anywhere a missionary is sent, every time a new church is born, anytime someone gives to her offering so that a lost person might be found, Annie is there. You know, as we get ready for a week of prayer this week and think about uh, our mission giving and mission offering and our Annie Armstrong offering, I want you to just, I want to challenge you to think about how, as a church, we exist for those who are not yet a part of us. That's why we exist. I mean, we're not heating this thing up and cooling it down during the summer so that we can have a place to hang out on the weekends. We really believe that, that the church's primary focus and, and primary purpose is for those who are not yet a part of the body of Christ. And many people in our community, many people in your family, many people at your job where you work, uh, many of them are just waiting, waiting for someone uh, to make a big deal about Jesus and to speak a positive word about what Christ can do. So not only give, 
But my goodness, let's go. Let's be those people in our community that are on mission for Jesus. Take your Bibles and open them to the 14th chapter of John. I'm only going to look at a few short verses today. And as we talked about, we're going to be trying to walk through some highlights of John. And especially those last 24 hours of Jesus' life as he's getting ready to go to the cross. And John 14 is where we are today. Last week we was in John 13. If you know anything about that upper room discourse, you know that it went John 13, 14, 15, 16. And some people throw in 17. But yet that was a private discourse where those who would be the movers and shakers after he were gone. They were going to be responsible for turning the world right side up because it was already upside down. That's what they were going to do. And yet Jesus had that FaceTime with them, that one-on-one -on -one FaceTime in that upper room. And he gave out that longest discourse of all the discourses. Uh, it's in John 13, 14, 15, 16, and possibly even 17. So it's easy to get discouraged when your world is turned upside down. It is. And yet today we're going to look at this God of encouragement. How can God be such a God of encouragement and his people oftentimes be so discouraged? And we're going to see how the Bible says that we can be encouraged. This ought to encourage you. This week, Mike Dean's uh, uh, mother turned 100 years old. We, we have a picture of Mike Dean's mom. Look at there. 100 years old. That's Bernice Dean. She lives in Jacksonville, Florida. And uh, so we're just excited about her turning 100 years young, actually. And um, a very young-looking spa lady. So uh, she just recently moved into a retirement home. So we would just want to uh, rejoice in that. So last week I talked about Jesus, uh, the humble son, and we talked about humility. And you remember we talked about of all the people that demonstrated humility, it was Jesus. I mean, Jesus became humbly obedient even to the death on the cross. You know, we talked about how that his obedience was not just something that he did in that upper room by getting down on his hands and knees and washing the disciples' feet. I mean, that Jesus was humble. Jesus demonstrated humility all throughout his life. Even where he was born was a picture of humility. He was, he was born in Bethlehem and laid in, in, a, in a bald manger in Bethlehem. And then when he dies, he's laid in a bald tomb in Jerusalem. I mean, can you imagine that? In fact, when people would want to follow after Jesus, and many of those people wanted what Jesus had in his hand, not what he had in his heart. So many like that today. I mean, I mean, I guarantee you, if you lost your job, your house, your wife, your husband, your children, your car, everything you lost, more than likely, more than likely, we would give up our faith. And yet those people in that day, like people in this day, we want Jesus for what Jesus can give us. And Jesus said, hey, do you know what you want? The Son of Man has no place to lay his head. And people left him when he realized he couldn't give them a place even to lay their own head. That is a picture to me of this humility of Jesus. As we, we talked about that in, in John 13 and how that, that Jesus was humble. He was humility, the, the son who was humble. And we talked about how that he, he was the example of all of that humility. I mean, if, if you ever want somebody to mimic with your life, be like Jesus. Follow Jesus. Don't just get the bumper sticker or the bracelet. It's got WWJD. What would Jesus do? Follow Jesus. Be like Jesus. Love like Jesus. Look at people like Jesus saw people. Spend your time investing in people like Jesus invested in people. Jesus was the example of humility. We talked about the explanation of that humility and how that he, he explained it to those in that room. And he explained that, hey, if I'm going to wash your feet, you need to wash other people's feet. 
He wasn't talking about foot washing. He was talking about service. Serve somebody. He exhorted them to serve others and to make it a point in your life to serve others. But we come to John 14 today and we're going to talk about Jesus. The son who encourages our discouraged hearts. He is that son. Not only the one that is humble, but he is the son who encourages us. He is our encouragement. And we're going to see that today in this passage that Jesus is making this statement to those that were in that upper room with him. He said, I want you to know I'm getting ready to leave and you can't go with me. I mean, can you imagine what they must have felt in that upper room? Jesus had taken John 13 and went over and over again by telling them that he was going to die and that Judas was going to betray him and that Peter, don't, hey, listen, don't think you're above this. You better buckle up, buttercup, because you're going to do the same thing to me. That's what Jesus does in John 13. They're already gripped with despair because they left everything and they're following Jesus. And Jesus says, I'm going to die and you're not going with me. Can you imagine the despair there? Can you imagine the, the, the discouragement that they must have felt? Thinking, hey, Jesus is going to leave and we're not going to leave with him? I mean, they felt that. They knew that. And Jesus understood that, that of all people, he understood that we are living in the land of the dying, but we are going to the land of the living. And yet we flip the script. And all those who were following him thought, hey, we're living in the land of the living. This is real living. And John 14 says, no, Jesus said, I've got real living in front of you. And one day you will experience real living. You will experience life like no other life ever. A life that is free from everything and anything that cripples your life now. I will take away all things that will create despair in your life one day. And I will do it. And I will get the credit for doing it. John 14 is that passage where... In that upper room discourse where Jesus is speaking to those disciples, that FaceTime that he's having with them, and he's getting ready to tell them to stop doing something. And that stop doing something is the very thing that they can have control over. And that is worry. Did you know that if you worry, you choose to worry? That if you're here with a disgruntled or troubled heart, that's not on God. Did you know that? That's not on God. In fact, if we go through our life filled with despair, do we get despair from God? No, because God is the God of all encouragement. How can the God of encouragement be the God of discouragement? See, the fact of the matter is our discouragement comes in our life when we take our eyes off the God of encouragement in our life. And Jesus knows that these people that he's getting ready to leave and they're not going with him. I mean, they will go part of the way. Some of them will go to, to dark Gethsemane. Some of them will follow him from a distance. Peter will warm himself by a fire. John the Beloved will be there with Jesus' mother at the cross. But when it comes to the tomb, they're not going in that tomb. Jesus knew he was leaving. And they were not going. And every one of them would be in despair. So he wrote words to encourage them. And then those words of encouragement, he writes to them. He wants them to know, this is what I want you to know. I want you to know that, that you can know me. You can go to where I'm going to prepare a place for you one day. And yet I will show you how to get there. And you can rest assured of that. And he encouraged those that were with him. And the way he encouraged them, he encouraged them by reminding them that he was going to destroy the sting of death. Imagine that. The sting of death. 
When the, when the Bible says that this, the, in 1 Corinthians 15, for, for this perishable body must put on imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality, but when the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. Oh, death. Oh, death, where is your victory? Oh, death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But, be, but thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Jesus is going to tell them, hey, guys, I am going to take the sting out of death. What's going to happen to me is going to be for your benefit because I'm going to remove the stinger of death. In fact, that very first verse, don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me, he says. Don't let your heart be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. Jesus is he's commanding them. If your heart is troubled, stop it. Just stop. Stop what you're doing and believe in me. Stop what you're doing. Believe in God. Stop whatever you're doing and know that I'm going to take care of you. I'm going to take care of you. This world may seem like it's falling apart right now, but I'm in the part, I'm in the business of putting together the broken things in this world. I'm going to take care of you. I was reading an excerpt from Kierkegaard's book on the invitation of Jesus this week. Sir Kierkegaard was a Danish uh, theologian, philosopher, uh, that, that made the statement about Jesus one day. And said, this is what he said. Jesus Christ in the Gospels is called the great inviter. Because everybody he meets, he invites. Everybody. Everybody. No matter where they are, no matter where they've been, no matter what the condition of their moment, of their life is at that moment, he invites them. Kierkegaard goes on to say that he invites every man that will come to him. He says, come, all you that need me, and you will find rest for your soul. It's what Kierkegaard quoted as Jesus saying. This is what he said. He invites the poor, the miserable, the despised, the disdained, the sick, the lame, the deaf, the, the blind. He invites the crippled, the discriminated against, the wrong, the offended, and the ill-used, the wealthy, the healthy, the beautiful. Jesus Jesus, with outstretched arms, invites all that will to come, to come to him. You know, when I was, when I became a follower of Christ, it was that invitation. It was the norm of an invitation in that day. Just as I am without one plea. You ever heard that verse? Just as I am without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me, and that thou biddest me come to thee, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am, and waiting not to rid my soul of one dark blot, to thee whose blood can cleanse each spot. O Lamb of God, I come. I come, just as I am, though tossed about with many a conflict, with many a doubt, fightings and fears within, without, O Lamb of God, I come, I come, just as I am, thou wilt receive, wilt welcome, pardon, cleanse, relief, because thy promise I believe, O Lamb of God, I come, I come. Can I tell you what Jesus is doing here? He's doing that inviting again. He's inviting the discouraged. Come to me. Come to me. And I will do this very thing that you could never do in your lifetime. I will comfort you in your distress. I will lift the pain of your despair. That's why I love what John 14 says. It reminds us that Jesus Christ encourages or discourages our hearts by taking out the sting of death. But he also does so by preparing us a heavenly home. This is what the Bible says. In my Father's house are many rooms. I know if you've got King James, it says mansions. And I know that 
there's a lot of discrepancy when it comes to mansions because that's a, a transliteration or maybe a verse that probably means rooms because there's nothing about a mansion that thrills my heart. When I get older, I want to get smaller. I don't want steps. I want a toilet and a half. You know, I don't have to have all those things that we thought we couldn't live without. But when Jesus was speaking, he said, guys, I want you to know something. I got some rooms for you. In the Middle Eastern culture of that day, everybody understood how this worked. When a family got bigger, you know what you did? You threw a couple of stakes out there and you added another sheet. And you put a divider on your tent and you added another room to your tent. And that's where that family lived. And when that family grew, you added another room onto the tent. And before you know it, you look out there and that one little clan of family can have just a tent city out there. Why? Because they all live together. They did life together. They loved together. They ate together. They shared together. They worked through things together. They were the family that did the things together. That was a beautiful picture. And Jesus is writing to all of those people that had been sleeping under the stars with him, bathing in the same water with him. In that upper room, he's telling them, guys, guess what? He said, I want you to know, in my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have told you. And that I am going to prepare a place for you. I'm going to prepare a place for you. I've got something in store for you. This is not all there is. These last three years, as great as they've been, I want you to know something. Me with you cannot compare to me in you until you come to be with me. That's the promise. That's why we can be encouraged. That's why whatever happens in our life, whatever comes our way, we can know that God is bigger than all of it. All of it. You may have read a portion of Sandberg's book on the prairie years. It was a contemporary book to Abraham Lincoln's era. And in the prairie years, Sandberg quotes uh, uh, about those prairie years, those difficult years. Where oftentimes when a family would move to make a settlement, half of the people would die. And when they would build something, the first structure they would build oftentimes would be a meeting chapel or a church. And they would come together on a regular basis and they would sing songs. Or, or oftentimes they would have a circuit preacher, whether it Methodist or Baptist, that would come once a month. But they would build these buildings, these log cabin churches, and they would worship together. And oftentimes, they would put the little burial plot out beside the church. Because when they would sit there in the church, they would look out there at those little mounds of graves out there, that fresh dirt where people would die through the week. And as Carl Sandburg said, he said one of the most favorite songs of that day was this. There's a land that is fairer than day. And by faith we can see it afar. For the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there. In the sweet, by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. In the sweet, by and by, we shall meet on that beautiful shore. And Sandberg said that people would sit there, even if they didn't have a preacher to preach that day, they would sit there and sing songs, and they'd look out those windows at those mounds of dirt where it represented family members that have already gone on. And they would be encouraged knowing that Jesus would one day bring them all together again. See, that's why we can be encouraged. You live long enough, you say enough goodbyes long enough, and then the fatigue of the heart can set in. And before you know it, you think that you're all alone, and you're not alone. Because the Jesus in you is enough to get you home and to encourage your soul. 
Jesus is the one who encourages our disheart, discouraged heart by providing the way home. He provides the way home. We'll see those verses in just a moment. He makes it clear that he is the way home. The way home. Well, out in Texas a couple of weeks ago, I was watching this preacher. And, and the preacher was telling a story about family feud. You know, family feud, you know, this day and time, family feud is, uh, uh, is a lot different than when I grew up on it. You know, Richard Dawson, anybody remember Richard Dawson? You know, the only way you can get on family feud if you was a girl, he had to lick your face or something. <laughs> he always was kissing all over everybody, you know, ew. I mean, you go to jail for that today if you're, you can't do that. But Richard did. And then finally, people got enough of his saliva and, and, and family feud was laid to the side. And then all of a sudden, there was a new, new and better and improved family feud. ABC dropped its indication. CBS picked it up. And then they placed in family feud a short man by, by the name of Ray Combs. Y'all remember Ray Combs? Ray Combs was that guy. He was that guy that was funny, jovial. He was a comedian by trade. And he did an unbelievable job on Family Feud. He was the nighttime version of Family Feud. And I remember hearing a couple of weeks ago the story about Ray Combs. Ray Combs, as it works out, you got contestants on one side and contestants on the other side. And Ray Combs was going down a whole list of contestants, shaking their hands, thanking them for being there. Where are you from? Tell us a little bit about yourself. And then he walks by this one father who is with the family, uh, with uh, the grandfather, and he has on a, on a jacket with a lapel pin. And the lapel pin has two question marks on it. And if you've ever done evangelism explosion, you know those two questions, right? And there are those two questions are right there on that lapel pin. And, 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 and Ray Combs goes by and sees granddad there. He said, I like that pin. What do those questions mean? And granddad looked at Ray Combs and he says, well, the first question is like, it's the two greatest questions that will ever be asked of you. The first question is this. He said, I, I won't, want you to know only you can answer the question, Ray. Do you know for sure that if you die today that you would go to heaven? And Ray Combs looked at him startled. He said, oh my goodness. This is live TV. We can't talk about that on live TV. This is back in the 80s. We can't talk about that on live TV. And he just went on down. And then he got a little bit further. And he came back to the guy. And he says, well, Mr. Combs. And I asked him. He says, sir, what's that other question about? And that other question was this. If God were to ask you, why should I let you into my heaven? What do you think you'd say? And Ray Combs, just like a deer in headlights, Looked and didn't know what to say. And then all of a sudden he said, I know exactly what I'd say. I would tell God I, de I deserve to be in heaven because I am the most loved person in America. I'm the nighttime host of Family Feud. And he will let me in because of that. And the crowd, woo, boy, they just buttered up. They just excited and everything. And Ray, he put that man on the spot. Well, two years later, Ray lost his gig with Family Feud. Within two years after that, he lost two of his uh, uh, comic relief stores or, or, or clubs that he had, went bankrupt. Shortly after that, his wife left him with, the, with their daughters, left him. And then Ray Combs was found in his own apartment and he ended his own life because life wasn't worth going. Can I tell you that Ray Combs learned quickly enough, and so will a lot of other people in this world, quickly enough, you don't get to heaven by the things that you have done that gets people's attention. You don't get to heaven by being good and liked and laughable. 
You get to heaven when you understand that, that this very Jesus in verse 6 said to, uh, to them, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And nobody comes to the Father unless they come through me. Jesus, I'm it. I mean, I can, I can lift the despair. Whatever the despair you have in your life, Jesus said, I want you to know, I am the way, the truth, the life. And nobody can get home unless they come through me. I am the way. There's no other way to heaven but Jesus. I am the truth. There's no greater truth than the truth about Jesus. I am the way. I'm the, I'm the life. There's no living. There's existing. But there's no living without Jesus. You can't live without Jesus. You can exist without Jesus. And a lot of people do a good job of faking it and thinking they're going to make it. But the fact is, you cannot fake that. Either Jesus is or Jesus is not your Savior. And when he's our Savior, he's our comforter. He is our encourager when we're overcome with despair. He encourages our discouraged hearts by reminding us that he will come for us. In fact, look at the verse. Verse 18 says, I will not leave you as orphans. I, I am coming to you. In other words, I will leave, but I'm not going to leave you forever. I'm going to send my comforter, the Spirit of God, that's going to be better than me beside you. It's the Spirit of God inside of you until we can be together forever one day. That's the promise. He said, I'm coming for you. In fact, verses like 13, uh, chapter 13, verse 19, in a little while the world will no longer see me, but you will see me because I live. You will live also. On that day you will know that I am in my, I am, uh, I am in my Father and you are in me and I am in you. And the one who has my commands and keeps them is the one who loves me and the one who loves me will be loved by my Father and I will also love him and will reveal myself to him. Peace, he says, I leave with you. My peace I give to you. I do not give as the world gives. Do not let your heart be troubled and do not let it be afraid. That's what he says. Don't let it be afraid. You've heard me tell you I'm going away, but I am coming to you. I will leave, but I'm coming back, and I'm coming back for you. Friend, I'm going to tell you, that encourages us. That should encourage every one of us today. That we're encouraged knowing that he's going to take care of us. Verse 3 says, And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again, and I will take you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That's what he said. Right before he said, I was the way, the truth, and the life. He said, I'm going to prepare a place for you. And guess what? I will come again, and I will receive you to myself, that where I am, there ye may be also. That you're going to be with him. One day you will be with Jesus. And here you will be with Jesus in heaven because Jesus Christ is with you now and he lives inside of you. You've trusted him. You turn from your sin. You believe that he's more than enough and you put your faith and hope and confidence in the person of Jesus Christ. Back in the day, day, in my last church at the good old Fellowship Baptist Church and in the backwoods of Lamar County. We'd go out visiting on Tuesdays and Thursday nights. We'd have 30, 40, 50 people go out knocking on doors. We'd do an evangelism schools about three or four times a year. And people were taking ownership of the community. 
I remember I was out with a group one night. We knocked on the door, and it was an old dilapidated old trailer park. And we knocked at that door, and the lady came to the door, and we told them where we was from and what we were doing. We just out talking to people about church and inviting them to church. So we went in, asked those diagnostic questions, wouldn't the EE questions. Hey, if you go to church, where do you go? Oh, Bill Watts was laying there on the couch that day, and he said, listen, when we get good and ready to come to church, we'll come to you. Don't worry about us. <laughs> that is a learned response. You hear me? People don't technically say that anymore because churches don't technically do that anymore. Because they die in secret. And nobody knows who they are. They just die. And they don't have nobody for them when they die. And I remember I was sitting in my office one day and I got a phone call from Miss Watts and she said, uh, you left your card. Bill died. You think you could do his funeral service for us? We don't know no other preacher. I remember I went to the funeral home, the Chandler funeral home, and there's Bill Watts in the box, and there's Miss Watts and the kids, and there was one little grand boy that just was just fascinated because he'd never been in a funeral home before, and he got up there, and he wanted somebody to pick him up so he could look at Papa in the box, and he was picking him up, and he said, and he says, where's Papa now? And he said, well, He's, he's in heaven right now. Well, I knew Papa better than the son knew Papa. He said, he's in heaven now. He's in heaven, but he's in the box, in the coffin. Is he in heaven? You know, we had that service that day. We get out to the grave, graveyard, and it was just nothing more than a family grave plot out in the middle of a cotton field, and the cotton was ready for, uh, ready for harvest. And we drive out there on a, on a fall day, and we're standing there, and old Chandler's put the tent up, put five chairs out, and I'm standing there at the head of the coffin, and I'm waiting to start the service, and that little boy's sitting there, and he'd remember what his father had told him in the funeral home, that Papa was in heaven. Heaven. And that little boy looked up at his daddy and says, Daddy, is this heaven? Is this heaven? You know, when you think about it, for that little old boy, the understanding of heaven could have just as easily been a cotton field. Because what we know about heaven, we know from the one who's made it so, Jesus. And Jesus has made a promise to us that he's preparing a place for us. And one day we will go be with him. And when we come to be with him, we're going to be in a place where there's no more, no more suffering and no more sickness and no more pain or death or dying or goodbyes. No more sin. All of that will be done. And he tells us all of this to encourage us. To keep on fighting the fight of faith and don't give up in the fight. Because we of all people are the most, should be the most encouraged people on planet earth. Because our future is secure in the person of Jesus Christ. When John was on that Isle of Patmos, and when he was writing about in the Revelation about heaven, he used the metaphor that, that best described it like no other. He said, he, the church is like the bride adorned for her husband. Everybody that read that understood that. The bride is no more beautiful than on the day of her wedding. And he said, the church is like that bride adorned for her husband. And he, the, 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 we, the bride of Christ, one day the groom's coming. Or if we go to meet him first, either way, we're either going to go meet him or he's going to come get us. But when he comes and gets us, he's taking us somewhere. Better than anything we could ever imagine. And he wants us to be encouraged by that. 
Because you may not have all the world's goods. But I'll tell you, if you've got Jesus Christ as your Savior, you're the wealthiest person in your whole family. There's nobody that knows the wealth that you have if you know Christ as your Savior. Let's pray. Father, thank you, God, that just like Kierkegaard said, that you're always inviting people. Lord, we do invitations in churches because you invited people. We came to you by faith one day because you invited us to come to you. Lord, we couldn't have come to you by ourselves. There was not enough times that a song could be sung that would, would lure us down the aisle. We didn't come because we were lured by a song. We came because we were convicted by your Spirit. So we come just like we are. We give you what we are. In exchange, God, you forgive us of our sins and you change us to make us the kind of people that would please you and glorify your name. So today, Father, whatever despair in our life, whatever the discouragement that some of us have drug in here today, we can stop it today. We do not have to live defeated. We do not have to live discouraged lives. We can be encouraged knowing that this is not all that there is, that the best is yet to even come. But while we are living in this life, God, we can reflect your glory. Father, we can encourage others to trust as we've trusted you. Lord, for that woman or man or young person today that's just the wait is over today. They're ready to just give their whole life to follow you. Lord, this is that moment that Jesus, the inviter, God, you called them to you. Right where they are in that pew, to just simply say, I believe, Jesus. I believe. I turn from my sin. I trust you to be my Savior. I believe in you, Jesus. Father, do something that only you, oh God, can get credit for as we stand to our feet. All to Jesus I surrender all to him I freely give I will ever love and trust in me his presence daily I surrender all I
All to Thee, my blessed Savior, I surrender all. All to Jesus, I surrender. Make me Savior, holy. Let me feel the Holy Spirit Truly know that Thou art mine I surrender all I surrender all All to Thee Blessed Savior, I 